So if you set up Google Analytics, if you copied and pasted your code, or you did the verify like some of you, there's nothing here to click really verify. There is a button that said send, tra test, send test traffic, but that's not exactly verify, so I'm not going to worry about it. Wherever you're at, I'm going to go back to the home screen. And again, you're going to see if you've got more than one account, which is a folder, you're going to see them listed. And if you've got more than one website attached, you'll see them inside. It's up to you however you want to manage this. In my company, I've got a different folder, I've got a different account for every client. And within the client's folder, or, or account, I've got then their sub-properties. In this one, it's got the YouTube channel, the main site, the other YouTube channel. On this one, it's got the, uh, the DeviantArt page. On this one, the main page, the blog, the YouTube, and the other thing. So, you can or organize them however you want. The only catch I suppose to tell you is this cannot be edited after the fact. So let me show you two mistakes that I've made that maybe will help you. What I've done here is I made a folder called Redbubble Store. That should actually have been made inside of vmcompost.com. There's a store that I have here, but I put it in a separate account instead of putting it in vmcompost. So this one should go in there. You would think, great, just move it. No, there's no way to move this. I've talked to Google on email and on the phone, and they keep saying, we're working on it, and that's been years. So how long does it take to fix this? They're not going to fix it. So what I'm saying is, if you created something on a separate account folder, and you want it in a different folder, it cannot move it. That's one of my mistakes there. And then on, I did it over here even worse. But, you know, it, it works, but it's annoying. You know, if you want to be organizational and such, this is annoying, but it works. In the beginning, we created the PMD Interactive folder, and we put these clients' content. We should have made that client in its own folder and put its data there. So the data is still there, no problem, but it's just organized wrong. And at the moment, there's no way for me to move this out of this folder into that folder. So that's why this one doesn't have all the data, because it's down here. And I have these waiting here eventually when they fix this for them to, for me to put it right, but who knows if they'll fix it. Um, I want to look, yes. Yes, right here. Yeah. UA 299-3-6-2-1, they're all part of the same main account, the same root code here, but then they've got a 2 or a 3 or a 6 or whatever. They all have their own code. So do you need to add analytics to YouTube? You don't need to, uh, but if you have a YouTube, I would. It's just another way to track the data, although the YouTube analytics itself is very good. I kind of don't see a lot of the point of this, but I've got it set up anyway. And, you know, the, the Google Plus page or whatever. Those other sites have, I think, better analytics than this, but I just have them set up just in case it, if there is something valuable to get out of them. In your blog, so it's just another page of your main site, right? Exactly. There's the, there's the top level of the site, and then there's the sub-level, which is the blog, and I've got a different analytics property on both to see if there's any different data. There might be. It seems that there's more traffic going to the main page than to the blog. Is that an easy thing to set up? Yeah, it's the same way that we did it here in that we added another property. It'll give us the code. And then I went to the page of the blog and pasted in the code. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's go up to the admin screen. And I'm going to show you something very valuable. Not everyone needs this, but if you need to do this, this will be great. Go up to the admin. Make sure you're in the right account and the right property. On view, you have all of these views, and you have goals. In my SEO class, I talk about conversions. Conversions, perhaps also known as goals. What are you trying to accomplish on your site? 
on my site I have a buy now button I have a sign up for the newsletter button I have submit your recipe button I have these various goals that a person can accomplish on my website I can set up analytics to pay extra attention to that and to give me data about how effectively I'm reaching those goals I can also attach a monetary value as we'll see but these are goals that I can set up that if someone accomplishes the accomplishes these things on my site they reached the goal I've made a conversion so if we take a look at goals you may or may not need this but it's still a good idea to look at it let's look at goals this is a brand new site so there's nothing to look at except to create a goal and there's two ways to do it the manual way which we'll look at first and then the template way which we'll look at second why reinvent the wheel let's reinvent the wheel first and then we'll look at the easy way if you click on new goal you have step one two and three step one are you trying to Are you trying to um, create goals based on revenue, acquisitions, increase, or engagement? So I've got a goal, let's say on revenue, uh, revenue, I've got reservations or place an order. All of these kinds of goals usually are set up uh, basically attached to something. So think about this. If someone has placed an order, they're in the shopping cart, they add to the shopping cart, they click check out, they click buy now, and eventually it takes them to a screen that says something like, thank you for your purchase. The only way to get to thank you for your purchase is if you went through the whole path of purchasing. There should not be a way for the user to get to thank you for your purchase any other way, except through go through the whole purchase process. So if I'm going to make up a goal of placing an order, I'm going to select that, and later on down here, I'm going to select what is my final thank you for your order screen. Acquisitions. How do I know someone really created an account? Well, I need to have some page on the website that is like, you know, welcome to the, w welcome to the, to the club or hello user. You know, I, I need to have some page, some end page that confirms that I've acquired a new user. Inquiry, refer a friend. Did someone click a specific email link? Contact. Is there a page with a phone number or directions or whatever? So all of these usually are attached to some sort of page that exists on your site, usually through some sort of path that a person gets to. So this can be complex, but the concept is that we can set up goals. Google will keep track of this and it'll give us a nice percentage of how well are we achieving our goals. For example, I'm going to go place an order. Continue. What would you like to call this? It's my place an order goal. Sure. Or I can call it place an order goal for the winter because I could have goals in the winter and in the summer. So I'll create a different goal for summer, a different goal for winter organize them into sets, just you know, folders. And what is the way that I prove that a person placed an order? Did they reach a destination page? Were they on my site for a certain amount of time? Did they go through certain screens? Did they, go, did they hop through three screens to get to that screen? And event is like play a video. Did they click the play video button? Smart goals is something new. We don't have it yet. But let's say it's the destination. They reached a, a, a destination page continue. Well, what is it? What was that destination? The page that they reached was the page called orderconfirm.html. Is there a value that I can attach here? This again will depend on you because if I made a sale and they have and I have a variety of products with a variety of prices I can't quite fill that in, but if I know that I've got some sort of donation screen 
and you can and there's only one donation set five dollars I can set it here so that every time that someone reaches that screen that in theory is five dollars that I earned so I can attach a monetary value and the funnel is well what are the steps that I'm going to count that people needed to take to get to that order confirm confirmation screen screen um, I could have I want people to go through the home page you know which is index HTML next I wanted them to go into um, shop page which was shop HTML and then check out check out HTML Again, this is, depends a lot on you. This is optional. You don't have to set a path because maybe I don't know what the path is. I want it to tell me. So let's say I'm going to count this as a completed goal if they went to that page through these pages. You can click verify to check it for me. This is a test site, so it won't work. And then I'll save it. So now I've, not, I've got a new goal. This screen will tell me at a glance how many completions or conversions. Again, this is pretty advanced. Not everyone needs this. But if you've got some sort of actions that you want to Google to pay more attention to, did someone subscribe? Did someone buy? Did someone do request a quote? I can set up these conversions, 20 of them, to, to track, to keep track of and see how well I'm accomplishing things. If that seems complex, we have import from gallery. People have been using Google Analytics for years, and people have made these sorts of goals already. And maybe you're going to find one in here that already fits your needs. You just need to change it for your own purposes. Let's say from e-commerce, highly rated. Why would I want a one-star result? Enhanced e-commerce analytics, e-commerce SEO dashboard, Magento checkout success. So you can import it. You go in and you fill it in. And now you have a new conversion goal. goals. Um, they can be very useful because that's how you can tell, is it working? Are my efforts uh, misplaced? Um, is it too hard? Maybe I have this set up and by the time someone gets to check out, I get a lot of ab abandonment, which is that someone gave up. They were going to buy my product, but at a per certain point they abandoned it. That might help me figure out that it's too complex my checkout process. What's that? Could you put new goals in there? Mm -hmm. Does it say custom? I'll check yours. Uh, yeah, I get a different one too. It says find an agent. Really? Interesting. Okay. Well, again, this is going to vary for different people. We're going to go, I'm going to go on, but during the break, we can look at it individually because that's interesting maybe that it's so different. The industry, you're the rest of oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe that industry, when, when you guys set up your industry, it might give you different goals here. If you want to change that, your industry is found back here under account, account settings. Or maybe over somewhere else. Maybe a property settings. Yeah, here it is. Okay. If you're going to change your industry, that might be a good point. So go to properties column, property settings, and there you'll see your industry. Okay. Okay. So we're going to move on from conversion goals. Any quick questions about conversions or goals while we, as we look at something else? Before we look at something else. So where would you find the results? So there's an order. 
we're going to see that right now when we go over to reporting. So there's a bunch of other screens for you to look at. There's always a help button and such, but let's look at the big aspect of Google Analytics. Click on reporting. Reporting. You have on the left side many views of your data. By default, when I clicked on reporting, it should have taken you to audience overview. You have all of these different sections on the left. Audience acquisition behavior. If you set up conversions, you will have a conversions tab. If you didn't set up conversions, you won't. You've got conversions, behaviors, acquisitions, audience, all of this stuff. You've got so much data to look at, you can create shortcuts. I need to educate myself more on intelligence events, so don't ask me what those are. Then real time, you can look at real time, do I have any traffic right now? There's some traffic on the site right now. And in the last 30 minutes, that's how the traffic looked like. And in the last 30 minutes, 67% has been from a mobile device to that client where the traffic is coming from and, and so forth. And they're going over to the choose a location to book a table. And they're from, you know, San Diego, Tijuana, and probably Austin, oh, McKinney, McKinney, Texas. So that's in the real time. All of these sections are going to have a lot of deep data and an overview. I'm going to go back to the default view, which was audience overview. We'll look a little bit at what this screen is telling us. The first thing is at the top right corner is your time horizon. We're looking at this in one month, an increment of one month. The longer you have analytics set up, the more data it can show you. In this one month, there were about 9,000 hits to the website. If I change it to you know, show me a year. One hundred and one thousand hits. Look at this data up and down, spiking. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. There's trends when you look at it that long, it might be too much of a big picture to look at. There's a year's worth of data for this client, and you've got then a breakdown, these different sections. Right here, sessions, users and page views are highly correlated. You can hover over many of these and you get a pop-up. Yes? Victor, earlier today we were also looking at the web, the webmaster skills, mm -hmm. and you also showed the same different charts. That was the question earlier, and and what I had said earlier was I haven't I haven't compared them close enough to see how similar they are, because usually I'm spending my time here, not on Search Console. I, I, I the, it's probably the same data, but usually I'm here. So under sessions, total number of sessions within the day. A session is the period of time a user is actively engaged with your website. So they're actually on your website. It's basically a hit. So that's the number of hits within that time period. Users, you know, that's someone that visits the website. And that includes new and returning users. Page views. Someone visits the site, but they view three pages. The home page, the buy page, the checkout page. So that's why that number is often much higher. This one user saw three pages. Well, here it shows, on average, every time someone visits, they're looking at about two pages. This is how long they're on the website. One minute, 40 seconds. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So it could be artificially inflated, but it does say repeated views of a single page are counted. 
So if I'm on the About page and I click Refresh five times, right. I have five more views. Well, what about in the users as well? Am I going to be considered three different users if I go on there three different times? Are you going to have a count of three? Yes, it includes both new and returning users. Oh, okay. So it will, it will count you more than once. Could I see a separate list of just with the list? Yes, somewhere in here it'll it'll tell us who's our data just for repeated or just for new. What's that? Sure, the slides says return visitor users. Yeah, this is another way to look at the data as well. So right here, a lot of new users coming in. Um, a lot of this data, I cannot tell you if it's good or bad. It depends on your company. I can tell you in different scenarios. For example, average session duration. This means, on average, in the last year, people have spent about a minute and 40 seconds on the site. That may be good or bad. If you're going to visit a restaurant site, for example, what's the, what are the main things you might be doing on that restaurant site? Check the, menu. Check the menu. Are they open? What's the phone number? Is that going to take five minutes? Is that going to take two minutes? No. So maybe on a particular client like this, this is enough time for someone to check the menu or place an order or look at a picture and that's it. So 140 might be fine for, the, for a particular client. What about if you're a blogger? You have a lot to say and your articles should take you at least five minutes to be read and they're only spending one minute and 40 seconds, they're not reading your articles. If you've got a lot of blog posts to read on different pages, but they're only visiting two pages, they're not reading your articles. So on that scenario, those might be terrible results. On another client, those might not be bad results. Related to that bounce rate, basically that's when someone visits a page and leaves before checking any other page. They come to your page, they bounce, they leave. Again, what's a good one? You might see articles that say, make sure your bounce rate is 30%. Depends on your site. If they come to my site and they go directly to a page and get the phone number and leave, it's okay that they didn't go to any other page. They got the phone number, they called the restaurant, they made an order. It's okay if it might be high. Conversely, <coughs> again, if you've got a lot of content to show and they're not hanging around and going to other pages, that might be a terrible bounce rate. And then you have to decide, can you build business on repeat customers or new customers? 77 might be a, may, might be a high number of too many new customers, or it might be a good number. It depends on your business. Maybe you've got new sessions of 20%. Maybe these numbers are backwards. Maybe you've got a lot of repeat customers. That could be good. Maybe you want new users. Maybe right now, one year in, I'm getting a lot of new users, but as the, as the site gets older and older and older, and that decreases, that might not be bad. That means I'm getting possibly a lot of repeat customers. So the big thing about all of this, Google Analytics and all of this stuff, is you're going to get all this data. Interpreting the data and doing something about the data, that's still another, that's still another kettle of fish. So looking further down here, demographics. You might even say, this is so scary what it knows. So looking down here under language, it says 78% of people visiting the website were <coughs> English speakers, US dialogue, a dialect. Next was Spanish, different dialect, generic Spanish, Spanish from Spain, Spanish from the US, sixth place was Russia, Seventh place what Russian. Seventh place was Spanish from Mexico. Spanish from Mexico. I don't remember where that's at. Christmas Islands, maybe. And Russia. So unfortunately, I do have to say it's always iffy when I see so much traffic from Russia. Mm -hmm. Span comes from a lot of Eastern Bloc nations. Um, but what what do I do with this data? Well, it might depend on a variety of factors. I'm seeing most of my most of my traffic's coming from the US, which, which would make sense because the restaurants are in the US. But if I want to, if I was focusing on getting Spanish, getting like a traffic from Spanish speakers, there might be a wake-up call that I need to put more effort into, into that demographic country. US and Mexico. US by a long shot. And then Russia. And then Canada the UK, Australia, etc. 
So where is all this data coming from? Every time our web browser visits a website, we're broadcasting a bunch of information we don't even know. Our language, our location, city, maybe not pinpoint accuracy, but in general. And for you as a private citizen, maybe that's terrifying, but me as a marketer, that's great, because then I can know my demographics. And marketing is all about reaching the right audience. So if I was advanced, I could figure out a way so that when someone from Canada visits, they get a pop-up that says, hey, Canadian visitor, 10% off for the next half hour. That would be obviously more advanced programming to get my site to understand that and to do something about it. But here I'm seeing Australians. Why would Australians be visiting? Again, lamb, barbecue, lamb is famous in Australia. I could set this up to target the Australian audience with special deals and such city Los Angeles this restaurant started in Tijuana came to San Diego is has expanded to Los Angeles they've been in Los Angeles about a year now in within a year they've overtaken doubled the traffic from San Diego they've been in San Diego for like seven years and in one year the traffic from LA has taken over makes sense it's a much larger population and such Chula Vista, so if we add San Diego Chula Vista, that's still half of what LA does. The recipe of the restaurant is Mexico City style lamb barbecue, some traffic from Mexico City. Not set often means they might be in private mode, you know, incognito mode, or some other way that doesn't show that information. Paradise, I don't think the paradise, probably Paradise, California or something. Ontario, Houston. What web browser? The most popular web browser is Google Chrome. Then Safari. Uh, Internet Explorer, Android browser, Firefox, Safari in app, so on the app. Opera, something called Ya Browser. I don't know what that one is. Mozilla, which is related to Firefox, but I guess different enough. Amazon Silk. Those are like the Kindle tablets and such. Again, if I were advanced, I could write some code on the site. So whenever an Amazon Silk user appears, they get a pop-up that says, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter for exclusive coupons. And this actually has happened. There was a company that was caught a few years ago using this for nefarious purposes. It was some travel website or hotel website or something. It was found that if people were visiting their website in Safari, their prices were a little higher. Now, who is usually the demographic that's using Safari web browser? Apple, Mac users. And if you can afford a $999 laptop, you might be able to afford a slightly higher <coughs> hotel rate, was their thinking. They got caught with that, and then they said, oops, that was an error in our programming, we'll fix it. And so now... It's probably still going on. So I'm telling you about it, but don't do it. Do it more positively <laughs> when you recognize that Opera users are visiting, you know. Do something about that, something positive. And we can go on and on. But you won't get any of this data until you're, until you're seeing, until you've set it up for a while. So the number one traffic on mobile is Android. iOS is very close, 46 to 51. And then Windows Phone, everything else in the dust. Of course, those are the two big operating systems. But for that, uh, for those 102 BlackBerry users that still come around, you could say, you know, sorry, sorry guys, here's 10% off. <laughs> Screen resolution. People used to ask, what size should I design my website? The answer has always been, I don't know. It depends on your traffic. So here, it'll tell me. The most traffic to this website is relatively low-end smartphones. Low-end, low-end, low-end. That's the only HD one. Fourth place, 8%. Low-end, low-end, low, HD, low, low. Most of the traffic coming to the site is low-end. So why am I going to put huge HD quality graphics if my statistics here tell me that I don't need to design such extravagant, for such extravagant HD screens, perhaps? Again, 
This is the screen quality, the screen size of people visiting on their mobile device. And so anything over 720 is considered HD quality. So anything below it is not HD, so lower quality screens. The highest quality screens are the small demographic, and the lower quality screens are the higher ones. So you can go in there deeper and you can explore it, but I'll show a couple more things and then we'll wrap up. Uh, what could be very useful is under, well, here's, if you set up a conversion, here's where you can look at conversions, overview, uh, goals, overview. So there's a conversion over here. What is that conversion? Like they purchased something? Well, that's what I was saying about earlier. I'm setting these goals. Goals are synonymous with conversions. I set up a goal. I set up a goal here that it was a book a table. I want to see the percentage of people booking a table in San Diego. So I set up the goal, and this is what happened in a year. There were 1,100 completions. I never set a goal value because that's hard to do because people are going to pay different amounts when they come to the restaurant. But that was a 1.15% conversion rate, and that might sound insignificant, but that's amazing. You're going to see, really, on any endeavor, especially online, your conversion goals are going to be very low. If you're rocking 10%, you're a superstar. 5%, you're doing really well. Basically, any percent below, like 1%, you're not, might, maybe you're not doing that well. But this is simply checking how well are people going through the process of booking a table at the San Diego location. You can set many more goals, like how many lamb tacos were sold. That could be another goal. We just wanted to set this one up. I can get the source from that. Where are people coming from to, to actually complete that goal? Number one result, an organic Google search. The second is a direct, meaning they might go directly to that address if they have it memorized or they might have the address bookmarked and they just go directly to the address. Third place is a Yahoo search result. And Bing, surprisingly, actually is sixth place. Yelp, traffic from Yelp, traffic from San Diego Eater, travel channel. This is only traffic, though, directly to booking a table. On another screen, I'll see the, tra the traffic in total. But if you set conversion goals, you'll see a new tab down here. If you haven't, you won't see that tab. What might be very valuable for you, regardless of goals or not, is acquisition. Acquisition, where did we acquire or how did we acquire our users? If you go to Acquisition and Overview, you'll see some data and charts. This shows 60% of traffic to the website has come from an organic search. Someone went on Google, typed some keywords, found the site, and clicked. 60% so is coming from the free method. 25% in this case is direct. Someone typed directly the name of the website without misspelling it, because it's hard to spell. Or they might have bookmarked it, and they went directly to the website, 25%. Next were referrals. Referrals, which are over 9,000, referrals um, are that they came from another website. They were referred to an by another website, which is technically different than social media. It's got its own slice. Referral would be there's some blog <coughs> post on the Travel Channel, on the Union Tribune. There's some link on someone else's website, and that website refers them back to this website that was about 9% of the traffic. And then we've got social. Traffic from Twitter and Facebook and Yelp and the other things it considers a social network. And of course we can see exactly what it means. We can go into each of these and click. 
very little traffic from email. We this one hardly engages in any email marketing. And then other. Not sure what other is, but there's other. And if you engage in pay-per-click campaigns, if you engage in buying AdWords and all of that, if you engage in you know buying positions and such, you would have that listed as well. So if I click on social, it will tell me. It considers Yelp a social network. I really wouldn't, but I could see why. But the number one search, I mean, the number one traffic is coming from Yelp, 2,600. Second is Facebook, 2,200. Third is TripAdvisor, 85, so it drops down quickly. Twitter, Urban Spoon, Reddit, I didn't realize that one. Google Plus, Meetup, Pinterest, and way down there, Foursquare. You can further click and go deeper into the data, but you know, there's all of these columns of data, pretty self-explanatory. If not, I can click the little question. I can organize these by columns as well. So when someone visits the website from YouTube, usually they view more pages than just one. If they visit from Pinterest, they view more pages than two and a half. People that are coming from Foursquare, view less than two pages. So on average, people are looking at about two pages every time they come from any of these social networks. And that might be okay, because they come to the landing page that I directed them to and they get their coupon and make the sale. It might be terrible for you if you are a blogger and they're not going to any other article on your site. These numbers can be interpreted. How does the saying go? Um, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Here's all of the statistics. So it's up to you to interpret how, what they mean to you. Um, under all traffic, you can go to referrals, and here you will see, well, what are those other websites that are linking to me? You'll get the exact page that the other website links to you. From Yelp, from Facebook, from the LA Times. So if I look at the LA Times, it says right here. So those three pages linked to the to the site. How many hits did I get out of it? The amount of traffic bounce rate very low. When they come from the when they come from that article of the LA Times, they stick around on the site longer. They go to other pages. They look at about three different pages, spend about three minutes. And some of those also then result in booking a table. 1.6%. Coming from those <coughs> three, you know, three we got 107 187 hits from that article. It resulted in three three booking a table. It's, that's terrible. I want a hundred booking tables. That's always much harder to do. All of this online stuff, all this digital stuff, it's easier said than done. It's always a numbers game. The more you can do this, that 1% with 187 people is only 3. But 1% with 1,000 hits, that's many more sales. So a lot to think about, but at least hopefully we've got it set up. You can keep exploring. You can go up to the that little. Some of you might have a video that shows up automatically. I hid mine, but you'll have this little mortar board here um, for more info or education. There's a bunch of videos and tutorials and help files for all of this stuff. There's a lot to learn here. You can teach a whole class on Google Analytics for four weeks. You can get you know a 200-page book on Google Analytics. So much, and they change it all the time. There's that brand new Google Analytics Premium. I don't know what it is. I need to research it. But it's one of the aspects of using Google as an advanced user. So as we wrap up the day, any general questions? Yes. The dash? Is that coming from the, 
WordPress tab to pursue the search engine optimization to use dashes rather than underscores? By default, WordPress is going to use dashes, and most modern software will. This is really the sort of de facto nowadays. Underscores <coughs> still work, but they're, they're, they're not in vogue anymore. So I wouldn't go back and change all your original file names to dashes because that's probably going to break everything <coughs> unless you also know how to set up on the server redirections. Google is going to try to go back to the old link. It won't exist. It will say it's broken. But I wouldn't go back and fix your, those ones. Going forward, I would use dashes. Wait, so when you name your file dash, you would use dashes? Like WordPress actually does it for you. Okay. When you write a brand new article and you write, you know, the history of barbecue, and you publish it, Google, uh, WordPress will automatically put the dashes for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is usually much deeper. cPanel can be very valuable. The default, the default stats from your provider can be very valuable. Um, but they've kind of all uh, acquiesced their power over to um, Google Analytics, because this is the one that's the industry standard. So you might not get as much deep data like this, but it's still probably going to be useful. If this is complicated, stick with your cPanel stats, and you can still create strategies based on it. But this is the one that's going to give you more data. How do you sh the, the goal would be to share it with your clients. That's a big can of worms there, but uh, you have a button here for export, and you're able to export it as PDFs and such, or spreadsheets. And then it's up to you to, you know, simplify it to the client so that they understand. And maybe just export because this is actually export screen by screen. It doesn't export everything. So you go to the most relevant screen, you export it as a PDF, and then you add your own comments and such and explain it to the client. Up arrows mean good. <laughs> Any other general questions? Mm -hmm. This is a class? This is as much as we get to. No, Maybe other instructors. At this college? Uh, maybe. I, I don't teach. I teach it here like this, and I teach it a bit, slightly variation, slightly varied in my SEO class. But to teach, you know, every single screen, uh, I don't teach that, and I don't know if any other instructors do. You can search it in our, in our catalog. All right, so there's a lot to think about. Hopefully you were able to set it up. If not, we'll have a little lab time until 1. I would recommend that you set it up as soon as you can and let it start tracking your data. We'll come back next week. Maybe we'll touch on it a little bit more if you have more questions. And then we'll look at the last item on our agenda, which is going to be Google Drive and Google Forms. Google Drive for collaborative cloud documents and Google Form for feedback forms. That's very valuable, too, to get feedback from our users. It will be next time. So make sure you signed in. And we'll do it again next time.